We are now at the day where we celebrate the resurrection of our risen Lord Jesus. Um, Easter, or now some folks don't like that word uh, because they think it's tied to a pagan word, but it's not, I promise you. I know that's been going around for a while, but that's been debunked. So the history and the linguistics. So anyway, Easter, Resurrection Day, Resurrection Sunday, whatever, the, the theme is still the same. And it's actually the most holy day of the Christian calendar. I realize that for most people, whether believe it or not, Christmas is a big day. But that's just due to the commercialization of everything. Because Christmas celebrates the birth of Jesus, and that is very important. But it does that in itself, other the special circumstances set him apart. But everyone that's ever been on the planet has probably been born. Just think about that. So in that sense, it doesn't set him apart in any way. And then we talk about the cross, but he wasn't the only one to be crucified on the cross because the Romans did it. That was the gas chamber, the electric chair, or the lethal injection of the day back then. So that doesn't really sell it, set him apart. But the resurrection from the dead under his own power, that sets him apart, and that is Jesus. And I realize we might have some skeptics here today, and uh, you know that goes into all sorts of apologetics. I'm not going to get into, get into the apologetics or answering skeptics' questions today. We've done that before. I decided to go a different route this time. So uh, what I want you to what I want you to see is this: what we'll be dealing with is the pattern of this, as we or want to do uh, throughout our series here. On, on where this thing starts in the beginning and works its way through. And so we'll be reading from Matthew 27, starting in verse 32, about the crucifixion. This is a very condensed account, concise account. doesn't have all the details of the ladies running to the tomb and all that. That's fine. Uh, we're just dealing with Matthews because I want to have more time to deal with everything that leads up to this. All right, so what I want you to th be thinking about here is the fact that Jesus was resurrected on the third day. Why the third day? Why not the second day? Or the fourth day? Or the fifth day? Or two weeks? Or as the British say, a fortnight afterwards? Why? Why the third day? And is that really important? Well, if you come here often, you know that, yeah, that's important. Anything stuck in there that seems a little weird or out of place, it's there for a reason. It's there because it's important. So let's look at Matthew 27, 32 with his account of the resurrection. It said, as they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. And they compelled, they being the Roman soldiers, compared this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them, casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. The two robbers were crucified with him. Then, excuse me, then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple, and here we go, rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel, let him come down from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God, let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour, now that's noon, the way they reckon time. The day starts at 0600. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. And, the ninth, and about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lima sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, This man is calling Elijah. 
And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let's see, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly this was the Son of God. And there were also many women there, looking on from a distance, who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him and among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him, and Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said while he was still alive, After three days I will rise. Therefore order the tomb to be made secure until the third day lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead, and the last fraud will be worse than the first. And Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go, make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. Now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, which is Sunday, Mary Magdalene and the other went, Mary went to see the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back, at the, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen as he said. Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee, and there you will see him. See, I have told you. So they have departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people, his disciples came by night and stole him away while you were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So he took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Now the disciple, now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had directed, directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to deserve all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now there's all sorts of symbolism and patterns and structure we could go through in what I just read, even in this condensed account from Matthew. Lots of stuff going on. But you get, once again, it is concise if you compare it to, to especially to Luke's account. But you have this idea of the third day. And I don't know that we always appreciate just how important that is because what we constantly see here as we study is that the pattern starts at creation and it runs all the way through. So you just pull on these different threads. No matter where you start there in Genesis, you, still, you always wind up at Jesus. And so Jesus is 
talks about the third day. He predicted that he would rise on the third day many times, and the apostles also mentioned the third day specifically. Now, the question you might be asking is, all right, Eb, is this just some other neat nugget to, to pick on? Or is there something really behind this? Well, I think there is. I think if you focus on the third day, then you get the total picture of what, why Jesus did what he did. Maybe a slightly different angle, but it still gets across what Jesus did for us. So Jesus said in Matthew 12, 40. There we go. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That quote is important. We'll come back to it here in a minute. Mark 8.31 and he began to teach them, this is Jesus, that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Luke 9.21 And he strictly charged and commanding them, this is Jesus once again, commanded them to tell this to no one saying the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. John 2.18 So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple. And of course he's speaking of his body in this case. Uh, and, and in three days I will raise it up. Acts 10.39 and we are witnesses of all that he did both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. Or, what's the Hebrew word? Hey, there you go. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear. And then finally, 1 Corinthians 15.3. says, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. This is the Apostle Paul speaking that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, buried, and that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. So we keep coming back to this thing, this theme of the third day, the third day, the third day. That's not just the name of a Christian group. It's there, and it was put in from the beginning because of what it represents. And so when Jesus comes along, it's essentially another from fulfillment of it. But once again, as we know, the context often eludes us in what is really meant behind, to be behind this, stuff that, that when Jesus said third day, in His day and time, people would have begun to pick up on fairly quickly. So why the third day? Well, it's part of a pattern. And the answer to why the third day is important to the resurrection is, we'll see, is that the biblical authors... And of course, Jesus himself, everyone that's writing or being quoted here, are drawing on a consistent pattern. And the pa pattern begins in, anybody want to care what, care to guess what chapter? Genesis, that's a book. What about chapter? Mm, pretty close, yeah, we'll go with that. It starts with a creation story, but it's, it's actually chapter one. I mean, yeah, chapter one. Because it's on the third day. You remember the first three days, Jesus, the Lord creates a void, a space, and on days four, five, and six, He fills each one of those. So in day one, you have a, a void or an empty place. In day four, He fills that. In day two, He creates another void or place. Day five, He fills that one. And then day three and day six also correspond. And it's on day three that God brings life out of death and chaos. You bring the dry land out of the waters. And the waters represent, in the ancient Near Eastern mindset, death and chaos. You can't live in that. So He brings the live ground, uh, brings the, the dry ground out of it. And what comes out of the dry ground? Tree, eights, there you go. Plants and trees. And plants yielding seed and trees bearing fruit. Now remember what we talked about on tree imagery, all right? So this all fits into that. You see, this is meant for you to take what we've already talked about, and if you think about it, lead you on to where we're going here with the gospel. 
So that's day three. That's the third day. You got life being brought up, new life being brought up out of the ground. And once again, remember your tree imagery. And then you have day six, which is a second third day, if you will. What is created on day six? Mankind, all right? All right, so man is formed from the dust of the ground. And once again, you see new life coming from the ground. Please note the connection between the plants and the trees and humanity because both bear seed and both produce fruit. We talked about that. Both are created on a third day. But there are two things that are unique to humans, one being that we're made in God's image, and two, God enters into a covenant on that second third day with mankind. We call that the dominion mandate. He entered into a covenant because he wanted the whole world to be like Eden, where God resided. And he walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. That's the, all the imagery that is there. Of course, they're banned and cannot get back in, eventually after the fall in Genesis 3. So on the third day, once again, new life, this time mankind and a covenant. And this happens in Eden, which, can anybody help me here, is referred to as a garden and also... A mountain or a high place. All right? That's important. So you've got new life, a covenant, and a high place. And that ought to be ringing bells with anybody that's been here regularly for a little while. So in each third day, what you have in the pattern, God created life where there was only death. He established a covenant with humanity. And once again, that took place in Eden. All right, which is a high, a high place. The next time we see a third day event is then, anybody help me with this? With the testing of a guy named Abraham. I know, y'all have eaten. You're eating and you're sleepy. So I see all the guys are like in football mode. All right. But you had, you had Abraham in Genesis 22, the first 19 verses there. You see that God wants Abraham to trust him with the covenant and the blessings that he's already told Abraham he's going to give him. And so what does he do? He tells him to take his son, his only son, the one he'd been waiting for for so long. And he says, now I want you to take him up to Mount Moriah, which is a what? High place. All right. I want you to sacrifice him. So you got cognitive dissonance. This makes no sense. You promised him to me. I've been waiting. The wife and I are now so old, our Social Security has run out. And now you want to kill the one thing we've been waiting on this, this whole time. And God says, yeah. But we all know the story. So they pack up. They head, they head out. And on that journey, they see Mount Moriah. Anybody care to guess what day of the journey? On the third day. They see the high place. And then, then Isaac has the, the what is he carrying on his back? The eights. All right, he's, a, he's got the tree. He's carrying up there for the sacrifice of a covenant on a high place. Of course, they get up there and, and Abraham's fixing to do the deed. And God stops him and says, that's fine. You've proven yourself. You trust me. And remember what we've said so many times about the tree, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of Tov and Ra or good and evil, is that the tree of life looks like death compared to what the world says is life. But trusting in that what certainly looks like death always brings life. And that's what Abraham has done here. This looks like death. He's fixing to put a knife in his son. God says no. God comes down, stops him, and then what happens? Sacrifice is there provided, a substitutionary sacrifice. And it is a ram caught in a eights. For those of y'all that are visitors, they keep saying eights. That's the Hebrew word for tree. And we just went through a whole series on tree imagery. I know that sounds so exciting. But if you study it, it really is pretty groovy stuff. So God saves him. God provided the substitute. Abraham received back his son. Isaac is given new life. God reiterates then the covenant. 
That's the pattern. High place, covenant, sacrifice. Same thing we went through with all the tree imagery. All of this once again took place on a mountain. Life is brought back from the brink of death. That's what you should, those are the boxes we should be checking as we move through. We then see the next third day pattern with Israel, the nation, and Sinai. God had just liberated them from the bondage in Egypt. Do you remember Moses goes to Pharaoh and tells him, let my people go, we want to go out to worship. And he says we need to go a certain distance. Anybody know how far that was? Three days. Three days. See a pattern here? Three days. Got to go three days. God said this is all in there for the purpose of hyperlinking so that we're supposed to, when we get to the New Testament, go, ooh, and go back. This must mean something. The emphasis isn't random. There's structure to this. Okay? So we, uh, we, we go, and, and after Israel comes through the, the, the Red Sea and all that, and now Israel winds up at the base of a mountain or a high place. So if the pattern holds true, then we should expect to see something. We should expect something to happen. If you're reading from Genesis on, and you're reading it as if it were fiction, then you should be going, ooh, ooh, they're setting me up, they're setting me up. Something's about to happen. And so God states then in Exodus 9, verses 9 through 16, that He will come to Israel at Mount Sinai on the third day again on the third day, to be with His people. And this is a test because He tells them that they are to prepare themselves to enter into a covenant with Him, with Yahweh, on the third day. Third day is mentioned four times in those seven verses or so. So once again, it's not random. It's there to draw our attention to it because it means something. So does our pattern hold? Yes, it does. God does enter into a new covenant with His people, giving them a new life and a new identity as His covenant people, a new way to live as His covenant people on a mountain on the third day. And eventually, if you go back originally, what does the original third day mean? New life out of death. And then it leads once again to the second, third day to a covenant. That's what you were supposed to be seeing. And once again, all this happens on a mountain or a high place. Now, unfortunately, Israel's story goes downhill, as we know, for the most part after this. They do not live up to the covenant. They do not live up to the way God says they should live. They are not examples to the nations around them. They do not set themselves apart. They quickly assimilate into the pagan culture around them, which is unfortunately what many believers do. And this is what has happened here. And you see, it just goes bad time and time again. Then there seems to be a little bit of a revival, and then they do well, and then they slide. And then they, God gets their attention, they tend to do well, and then they slide. And it's always this idea of repent. We know, what does that word mean? Turn to turn around. Go the other way. You're walking the same way as everybody else. Turn around and go back the other way. Like I said, that has a lot of religious baggage. Go oh, just be sorry for what you've done. No, you've, it's not feeling sorry as much as it's living a new life and turning around and stop acting like all those crazy people out here. Go a totally different direction. And the prophets are constantly telling them that. Telling Israel, you've got to repent. You've got to turn around. You've got to get back to the covenant. You've got to get back to the way that God's people are supposed to live that separates them from the world so they can see, so you can be an imager of God, so you can reflect the character of the God of Israel as opposed to the characters of all these little G gods that they've got running around everywhere. And they do it for a little while, but then they slide. So then you eventually get to the prophet Hosea. We see him calling the people to return to Yahweh in Hosea chapter 6. We just do a couple of verses here. Now look at the language that he uses. Come, let us return to the Lord. That's repentance language. For He has torn us that He may heal us. 
He has struck us down and He will bind us up. After two days He will revive us and on the third day He will raise us up that we may live before Him. So Hosea calls the nation to repentance, urging them to return to the covenant, big deal, made at Sinai. And then he uses this resurrection language, which is following the pattern, showing that God creates or renews life on the third day. And it's a hope and a picture of resurrection life. Just as for us, baptism, you go into the water, you come up as a new creature. Where do they get that? Because the creation story, life and order comes out of the water where nothing lives. That's chaos. That's death. That's darkness. That's the tomb. All right? So, so coming up out of the water when you're baptized, as Israel goes through the Red Sea, as Israel crosses the Jordan River, as, as you come up in their culture, if you would be in a ritual bath in a mikvah, you go down under the water and you come up, you are cleansed, you are a new creation. And that comes all the way from Genesis 1. We don't see it that way because we want to turn it into a science book, but it's not. All right, You go down and you come up as a new creation, and that's what Hosea is referring to here. Then you have this other guy named Jonah. Some of y'all might have heard of him. And he's a prophet. And God tells him to go to Nineveh and preach to Nineveh. So that because God wants to heal their land, He wants to heal them, He wants to save them, He wants to bless them. And Jonah's like, No, I don't want to do that. Why not? Because I hate them. Nuke them. And God said, No, I'm not going to nuke them. I don't want to nuke them. I want to save them. And Jonah's, Well, I don't want them saved. I'm not going. And it was like an old preacher once told me years and years ago when I first started ministry. He said, Son, your arms are not long enough to box with God. And that's what Jonah's doing. He's boxing with God. It's when a child throws a tantrum. You're boxing with a parent. And a little kid, your arms are not long enough. They might let you win. That's what a lot of them do nowadays. But at any rate, um, you, you can't win that fight. And so Jonah gets on a boat and he heads the opposite way. And of course we know that then there's a, a, a storm on the sea. And they try to figure out what to do, and Jonah said, it's me. So they throw him overboard, which was what they often did with people if they thought you were the cause of the storm back in those days. Well, he's causing it. We just get rid of you. And, of course, then the story goes that he's swallowed up by a great fish, and everybody wants to figure out what kind of what fish was it. Stop. Not the point of the story. How could he live three days in the bit? Stop. Not the point of the story. What's the purpose of the story in their context? Three days, but what does water mean? Chaos. He's thrown into the deep. He's thrown into chaos where there is no life. Where life does not exist. In their mind, we know there's you know, fishes swimming around and all that kind of stuff. But in their mind, that's danger. You don't do that. To them, it represents death, chaos, sheol, disorder, everything that is not God. Then he's swallowed up by this fish, according to the story. Now, in that day, a giant fish represented the tomb. It represented death. And he's been carrying deep, being carried deeper and deeper into the abyss, into death and chaos. That's the point of the story. Now, you can sit there and argue all day long about did it could, you know, how long could he survive with all stomach acid, and I've seen all the garbage. The point is, that's not the point of the story. If you were to walk up to the Assyrians, the Ninevites, the Israelites, or even Jonah himself, and try to start quizzing him about that, they, they would all look at you like you've got two heads. Say, that's not the point. The point is, Jonah goes into the tomb. He goes into death and chaos, and he's there for how long? And then the fish vomits him out onto the dry land. After Jonah's prayer and his repentance is heard. That's the point of the story. That crying out to God brings you out of death. And so in the framing of the story, what happens to Jonah? He comes out of death, out of the water, onto dry land, which is why they're so careful to say it that way. 
He's got new life. Because he was in death. And who brought him out? Who gave him that new life? God did. And now he's ready to go and do what he was called to do in the first place. It goes back to one of the greatest movies ever made, Cool Hand Luke. Because, see, Jonah's going the wrong way, and God is saying, what we have here is a failure to communicate. And this is the way he likes it. So he gets it. Now, Luke, I'm being good to you. I wish you weren't being so good to me, boss. Bam! Don't sass me, boy. It's a great scene. Great scene. Just, just literal, it's littered with biblical stuff all in the movie. I watched a million and one times. Uh, one guy that's new to the church when I pastored in Mississippi, he said, uh, I never realized that church has so many biblical references. He said, I watched it the other night and I saw he jumped off a bridge into the river. Is that like being baptized? I said, yeah, man, if you want it to be, that's what it is. So Jonah, you see, is carrying out this same pattern that we've seen from creation throughout, and you've, got, you've linked once again to three days. Now, by the time Jesus comes around, there's another thing that deals with three days, and the skeptics would say, some will say, well, he, Jesus just swooned. You know, he just he wasn't really dead, they just thought he was dead. So, and then he put him in the cool tomb and he revives. Well, they had a rule for that, so you didn't bury live people, and that was that you, you kept watch over them for three days. Because they weren't going to stay unconscious for three days if, you know, if they're just unconscious. Even in you know, medieval Europe, they would have, that would happen. So you'd have a string run up from the casket through the ground to a bell. So if you woke up underground, you could ding, 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 and then hopefully somebody would hear you they would have somebody sitting around the grave and dig you up, which leads me to another. That was a great, um, what was a uh, Alfred Hitchcock show. On that, that happened. Freaked me out, man. Great show. But at any rate, that's what you see the, you see the imagery. And that's what is to be brought out of Jonah's story. Then by the time we get to Jesus, Jesus speaks of the third day 21 times in the Gospels. So once again, there's no randomness to this. He's doing it because the Hebrew mind that is there, and even some of the non-Hebrew, non-Israelites that are familiar with ancient Near East, they hyperlink to all these, all of a sudden their brain starts pulling up third day, third day, what happened on the third day, and they go all the way back to this. So there's a lot being said that's not necessarily said, but for us, being you know, 2,000 years removed and a half a planet away, it has to be said. But once we, what we see in the pattern is that it represents God bringing forth life and entering into covenant on the third day, resurrecting new life from the ground at creation on the third day. And then Jesus brings about a new covenant and a new life in the kingdom of God that He's inaugurating on the third day for all who believe. And that's an important distinction for all who believe. For, but for those that don't want to believe, okay. He'll give you what you want. That's often the way God judges people, by giving them what they want. It's the same way you stop a dog from chasing a school bus. You let him win. And the next day when the bus comes through, he just lays there in the yard. I paid it. I beat it. What am I going to do now? So God will give you enough rope to hang yourself, as the old saying goes. That's what you want. You want to be like the world? Go ahead. Then you'll reap the repercussions of that. And so there are only two options at the end of the day, heaven or hell. And you say, well, I don't like those. Well, guess what? When you create your own universe, you can make the rules. But whoever owns a candy store, their jelly beans are free. Which means if you make it, you can make your own rule. But there are only two options, you see. Life, eternity spent with God. Or for the unbeliever who says, I don't want to spend it with God. Okay, you don't have to. You're not going to like it because there's only one other place to go. You're not going to like it. But if that's not what you want, you don't want to stay with me, you don't have to. Those are the three options. So all of these blessings, this new life, this covenant, is for those that believe. 
And that can also have the intellectual side of, of working through that. That's fine. I'm all here for, I'm all for the conversation. But Jesus brings all this about. And this pattern will continue until we get to that final resurrection where Jesus' followers uh, are resurrected to new life with Him and where God restores all of creation to a new life in the new Jerusalem, the new heavens, and the new earth. If you remember through some of our studies, we talked about, in the last one I think it was, how you deal with, you go back to the fall in Genesis 3. And then there's this, what's called the Proto-Evangelium, the first gospel. And it says that a, a, a someone is coming and he'll crush the serpent's head with his heel, the wounded victor, the hero. And then you're meant to read it as you keep going. Every time this other major character is introduced into the narrative, is this him? Is this him? And so you think, you know, well, is Cain and Abel? Well, that's gone right quick because Cain kills Abel. So... Is it Seth? And then everything just goes downhill, goes to hell in a hand basket very quickly. And then all of a sudden you got this, all kinds of stuff going on, violence, angelic rebellions, and all kinds of weird stuff. And you got this guy named Noah. And you're meant to ask, is this him? And what does he do? He has an eight, he has trees, he has an ark, he's on a mountaintop, God gives him a covenant, new way to live. He sees all this new creation. You see all that imagery. But then he fails. And then you get Abraham. And Abraham really passes one test that we're shown. Then you get to Moses. And Moses passes some tests, but others he fails. But where he passes is because when God tells him to do something, it looks totally ludicrous. That makes no sense. God, he, Moses simply does what he's told. We even see Moses, when Israel's gone crazy, just after the covenant, and they're worshiping the golden calf. Moses goes up where? To the high place, because that's where God is in their mind. That's where that works. He goes up there and he says, Don't, don't kill them. Don't get rid of them. If you're going to do, kill anybody, kill me. He offers himself as a sacrifice. And God says, Thanks, but no thanks. Why not? Because he's not the perfect sacrifice. Because Moses fails. And then you go, on down the, you go on down the road to King David. We work through all that. But you see, the thing is, Jesus is the one that's willing to offer Himself for everyone and doesn't fail any tests. And so by the time you get to the New Testament, we should be checking the boxes that this is the one promised, is, promised in Genesis 3.15. And if we're pulling on that thread of the third day, the minute Jesus starts talking about third day, third day, third day, third day, you're supposed to be jumping out of your seat as you're reading. Wow, this is Him. This is Him. This is Him. So by the time you get there, if you understand the imagery behind it, it can't be a random idea. Jesus arose on the third day in order to show and complete the pattern of God's creating new life with a covenant on the third day. And for those who believe, that is exactly what we have in our faith of the resurrection of Jesus. Just as God rose Jesus from the tomb, the earth, in the ground, the grave, same, same concept, on the third day, we who believe can also be resurrected into a new life, a new type of life, eternal life with Jesus. And as for now, remember what Jesus told His disciples before He left this earth. And we've been talking it because somebody will say, well... I want the good stuff now. Well, we're talking about that on Sundays. And so if you want to understand what that means, come back and see us next Sunday. Now, before I close out, you say, wow, he's went quick. Yes, yeah, it's Easter. I want to see my grandkids a little longer before they head back home. And y'all all want to do the same. So we're not going to sound, sit here all day just to keep you for a time limit. But what I want to say is this, because for some, you know, Christmas and Easter are generally days you get folks in church that you never get in before, for whatever reason. Sometimes Mother's Day, you can do that. And back in the day, my job was to travel and debate. Atheists and whatever, evolutionists, all that kind of stuff. And they're generally looking for an intellectual answer. And we've got them. What 
I never understood was how they thought some of their answers were intellectual. <laughs> but, so they won't, the onus is on us to be scientific and logical while they believe in crystals or whatever. What I want to say to you if you enter, are in any camp of unbelief is Christianity can hold up to any objection you might have. If you want to go through the laws of logic, we can. And we win every time. Nothing circular. We don't violate the law of non-contradiction or any of the rest of them. That conversation can be had if you truly want to have it. I can't sit here and prove a miracle. By definition, that is something that happens outside the bounds of science and doesn't happen often. I can prove that most scholars believe there was a guy named Jesus. I can prove that we see these patterns scattered throughout this writing of you know, 60 different authors over, or 40, whatever the, however many authors it is, over thousands of years. I can show you that what it says has come true and is coming true. And so at the end of the day, the only obstacle to believing in a new life and a new covenant and a relationship with God is going to be a heart that just doesn't want it because we don't want anybody to be the boss over us. And if you go back once again to Genesis, you find out that's the problem mankind's always had. Always has been, always will be. That's why no institution is perfect, no matter how many laws or regulations you set in place. Mankind will find a loophole. That's what we do. How many times must I forgive? Seven? No, 70 times seven. And then we do the math. So on the 490th time, I can smoke the guy? <laughs> Turn the other cheek. Well, I only got two. Technically, you got four. But <laughs> turn, you know, one, two, and I'm not do three, four, but one, two, now I can smoke him. You see, that's what we want to do because that's what comes naturally. But that tree of life does not come naturally. That tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that's what comes naturally. And it's shiny and it's sexy and it looks like I can have it all now. But every time it leads to death. The tree of life looks like death. This is not going to work. It can't. Look what so-and-so is doing. He's making millions of dollars. It looks like it can't work, but as we see, just as Abraham taking his son up on a mountain to kill him, that can't work. It did. And it's happened, the pattern you see all throughout. It looks like death. It leads to life. It looks like life. It leads to death. So it comes down to trusting God. And if you want to live eternally, then you've got to trust Him that what looks like death, laying someone in the ground and all that, does lead to life. And He's the only way out of it because He's the one that created life. So for those who believe, what we have in our faith is just that. A new life and a new kingdom and a new covenant. Shamefully, what turns a lot of people off is those of us that claim to be believers do not live According to that covenant. We act like everybody else sometimes. We lose our cool. We give them the number one driver award. We want to pop a cap. We want to get pop a cap in them. We want to beat them down. And all that. You know, and I'm a peaceful man until you mess with my family or somebody else. Then one of us, if not both of us, is going to the hospital. But I'm not looking for trouble. I'm not looking for a fight. I will be. I will try to get out of it as peacefully as I can. We don't go. We're not supposed to go looking for trouble, but we do. And even sometimes when we're defending a good cause, we look like idiots doing it because we're screaming and hollering, and we look just as bad as the nutcase on the other side of the street with their sides. It's not the way Jesus would do it. So as for now, remember what Jesus told his disciples. His disciples before he left this earth. If it's going to get any better. Before Jesus comes back. Because if we believe we're in the kingdom, we've been given that new life and a new covenant, which means we're supposed to live a certain way. And as we've been saying, if you want it to get better here and now, then everybody's got to start living by that. 
And now the world's not going to do that. We've got to do it in spite of the way they think, in spite of the way they act, in spite of what they do. We've got to do it anyway. And you know what that means? It means sometimes you're going to eat some crow. It means sometimes you're going to take a butt whooping. It's a nice way of putting it. You've got to be humble. We've got to be humble. But look, Jesus gives, look what he says in verse 20, Matthew 28, verse 16. It says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain, to a high place. Because symbolically, that's where God, even the pagan world, you know, Zeus is on Mount Olympus. That's where the gods are. Went to the mountain which Jesus had directed them, and they saw, and when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, to Jesus. Go therefore, he charged them, and make disciples of all nations. Not just folks that look like you. Not just folks that think like you. Not just folks that have a similar passport. Of all nations, baptizing them. What does baptism mean? Represent coming up out of the water and death into a new covenant, which is what the resurrection is all about. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Was he? We're talking about that now. Living the covenant, the new life, so we can be imagers of God and show the character of God to the world. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So we are to go and make disciples. And as we've been studying in our series on the Sermon on the Mount, that once again, that's how we are to model the new kingdom to others. But none of this can happen in a person's life until they've been redeemed by Jesus. Because Jesus is not just another life coach. He's not just another TED talker. He's not one of those motivational guru guys that goes around for... $50,000 with one of these things on. Uh, he's not one of that. No, he's not that. He's the only way back to Eden. Because he's the son of God. You eliminate that, that supernatural aspect, and all you've got is another life coach. Do this and life will be pretty groovy. But he can't help you once you breathe your last. He can do nothing to extend time to eternity. He can do nothing to heal you, change your heart. He can change the way you do things, but he can't change your heart, and that's the difference. Redemption has still got to be part of it. And it was a substitutionary redemption, as we saw from Genesis. So the perfect sacrifice, who rose in order that we will one day rise to be with him in his kingdom for eternity, that's Jesus, and it happened on the third day because that's when God creates life. And what does he do then? covenant and there you have it that's why Jesus had to raise on the third day and I didn't make it up once again you go back to the beginning as with any other book don't start at John go back to the beginning and read it like you would another book as if it were fiction though it's not and see God jumping off the page trying to get our attention if we understand the context and so that's what Easter means what the third day means. New life and a new kingdom and a new creation with a new covenant. Do you believe? Will the pattern continue through you and your life or does it, do you end the cycle? Maybe you are beginning to believe. That's fine. I get the mental ascent. I get it. I get it. I get it. I've seen very few people just cold called and bang, all of a sudden get saved and baptized, you know. Just for the people in the Bible, they've heard Jesus for a while and they're thinking and they're working through it. Because it's, you know why? It's difficult because it's totally backwards. It's upside down from the way everybody thinks. Maybe you have questions or concerns. That's okay. Jesus has the answers. But I ask you, if you're in that state, to prayerfully consider the meaning of Jesus' resurrection, a way to become a new creation, risen to new life, and a new covenant with the Creator of all things. That's what I want to leave you all with today, if it's new to you. If you want to get that settled, as the worship team plays the last song, you can come up here and talk to me.
But if not, you already know. At least you got one more tool in your bag for understanding what, what the third day means. And it's not silly. It goes down to the root of all of it. Would you all bow your heads, please? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for this day and all that it means. Lord, when you came down and took the ultimate punishment for all of us, and you sent your Son who passed the test for all of us, because we can't do it. And you sent your Son who resurrected on the third day, because that's the day when you create new life out of death, and you enter into covenant with your creation. And so, Lord, we thank you for that and all that it means. And, Lord, I just ask that you touch the hearts of everyone here, believer and unbeliever alike. Don't start a work. Let them ask the questions. That's, we don't mind anybody asking questions. Ask all the questions you want. So, Father, we thank you for this. And, Lord, as we go throughout the day and the week and the rest of the year, please, for those of us who believe, keep it in our hearts and minds just what that means a new life, a new covenant, a new kingdom. And may you convict us to live that way, Father. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.